Hello and welcome to this video where I'm going to try and answer the question, are maths exams predictable? Throughout the video I'll share my thoughts on this topic and also towards the end of the video I'll show you my topic analysis tool that's formed the basis of my practice papers that I've written this year. The term predicted paper is actually relatively new. If you look before 2014 it wasn't searched for very much at all. However since then there's a spike every year around the exam season. You can even see the dip when we had COVID-19. But there's also a huge peak last year where the term became more popular than ever. Right now students are asking for predicted papers, hoping it will be a quick way to learn their subject. Staff are emailing me asking if I'm going to write predicted papers, and YouTube content creators are even using the term in their thumbnails as a form of clickbait to try and increase the number of views. There's even a marketplace for predicted papers. These tend to be advertised more towards parents and students. Who would believe that if they're going to spend money on something, it might give them an edge over everybody else? They're also accompanied with misleading language like this. A good estimate for the topics that will come up this year specifically. This year is no different to any other year. So in reality, these papers are just practice papers, no different to past papers that are freely available on many places across the internet. I'd advise you to use caution if spending money on papers that make such claims. You'd be right to point out that last year I also used the term predicted paper. But last year was a little bit different since we received advanced information. But since 2022 the term is being massively overused and is not really representative of the resources that are being created. I've instead opted for the term practice paper, since I think it's more representative of what the materials actually are. Using the term predicted paper is quite misleading. I've even seen comments on predicted papers asking if it is indeed the real paper that they're going to sit this year. For math specifically, you ought to question how people can predict papers 2 and 3 now when they haven't seen paper 1 at all. Let me give you an example. The topic, cumulative frequency diagrams, is quite a common topic and it tends to come up almost every year, but it's spread quite evenly across the three papers. For Edexcel, historically it's come up in paper 1 40% of the time and paper 2 and 3 30% of the time. Now it's also a topic that doesn't tend to come up more than once, so once we've seen it, we're probably not going to see it again. So let's imagine it comes up in paper 1. This means it's probably very unlikely to come up in paper 2 or paper 3, but this hasn't stopped many people from creating predicted papers 2 and 3. In reality, all these predictions are, are just hopeful guesses that these topics may come up in those papers. You'll see for example from my website that I haven't decided to publish papers 2 and 3 yet. I'm going to wait until I see paper 1 first, and after this point I'll publish some practice papers for 2, and then after I've seen paper 2, I'll publish some practice papers for three, since I'll have some information about what topics have already come up and therefore are less likely to come up in the future. You should also be very wary of people claiming that their predicted paper will apply to all exam boards. Whilst they all do cover the maths GCSE, there are some differences across the boards. For example, if you study at Excel, you'll probably know what this diagram is. But if you study AQA, you may not have a clue at all, and you don't need to because it's not going to be assessed. Another example would be a question like this. Students could be asked to rationalise the denominator or express this in a certain form. You'd be quite familiar with this on the Edexcel papers, but it's not going to be assessed in AQA. The AQA teaching guidance specifically says they'll only do rationalise the denominator in the form square root A or B root A. Yet I have seen predicted papers for AQA which include questions like this. This is typically because teachers in the UK only teach one exam board, so they become very familiar with it and don't understand the subtle differences with the other exam boards. I, for instance, am very familiar with Edexcel and AQA, but I'm very unfamiliar with the OCR specification, which is why I don't write materials for them. So each of the practice papers that I produce this year will be specific to one exam board. I certainly won't pretend that they're applicable to all. So with all of the previous points aside, predicted papers still aren't necessarily a bad thing. Any practice of maths is good, and I'd encourage you to do as many past papers as possible before you do your real exam. These can of course include these predicted papers, just remember that they may not actually reflect the exam when you come to do the real thing. So why is it that people try and predict maths exams? Well let's take science. There are three different areas of science, you've got biology, you've got chemistry, and physics, and you certainly wouldn't expect any physics questions in your biology paper. And science at the moment is usually assessed across six papers, there's actually a second biology paper, a second chemistry, and a second physics. And these contain different elements to the previous papers, 
So biology has clearly been split into two distinct areas, and you know roughly what topics might come up in those exams. For English literature there are two papers. You know the first one will include something on pre-19th century texts, so some Shakespeare. And for the second paper you know it's going to be modern texts and poetry. So depending on what you've studied in your school, you may be expecting a question on a play, for example, like an inspector calls. Maths, however, is very different. The only thing that you do know is that the first paper is non-calculator, and papers 2 and 3 you are allowed a calculator. But you could be assessed on any of those topics in paper 1. And the same topics could be assessed in paper 2, and in paper 3. Depending on the way they ask the question, they could ask almost any topic in any of the papers, apart from possibly use your calculator to work out which would always appear in paper 2 or 3. This means that for most topics, if it appears in paper 1, then it's probably very unlikely to reappear again in papers 2 and 3. Also, if we don't see a topic in papers 1 and 2, it greatly increases the chance that it might appear in paper 3. This is because the exams are written to give a wide coverage of the curriculum. If the same topics came up on each paper, they wouldn't really be assessing enough topics. So up and down the country, the same thing tends to happen in many different schools, possibly hundreds. Students will come out of their exam and talk to their teachers about which topics they saw in the paper. The teachers will then start to consider which topics haven't been assessed yet and plan for those. Students will then begin to focus on their next exams and go and revise for those, whereas the maths teachers within the same school are likely to work together to plan materials for the following lessons, based around the topics that haven't yet been seen. And sometimes you can get really lucky with this. Here's an example of a question that I wrote for my students back in 2019. Every student I saw did this question on the morning of the paper 3 exam. And they were very happy when they went into the exam and saw this question. It's nearly identical, but ultimately this is just luck. There was no amount of predicting here, I just selected a topic and selected a style of question and got really lucky. This doesn't happen very often at all. So this process may happen in your school and it happens in many schools up and down the country. But unfortunately, the UK education system doesn't encourage collaboration. One of the ways that schools' performance is measured is how well their students do in exams. So it tends to become a bit of a competition, which unfortunately means that people don't tend to work together very much. And this is how things were up until 2022, when everything changed because we received advanced information. Students and staff were given a list of the topics that would appear in each of the papers. So this one here, for example, from AQA Paper 1 in November. So now we'd been given a list of topics for each of the papers. So that element of guessing was removed. So it seems as though exams were really predictable now. However, it still wasn't really the case. If we take, for example, this part here where it says equations linear. So we know there's going to be a linear equation in the exam. But it could still be asked in many different ways. Could it be a one-step equation? Maybe a two-step equation? There could be brackets. There could be unknowns on both sides. It could even involve fractions. Or it could be combined with a completely different topic in a problem-solving question. Or you could be asked to criticise a student's response to solving an equation. Or you may have to form and solve an equation. There are just too many different ways of asking each of the topics. So whilst we were given this advanced information, exams were still not really predictable. There were some successes, however. For example, take this question here that was in my practice paper, and this is the one that came up for real. I've had to blur this question since it's currently on a secure paper, but even from the blur you can probably tell how similar it is. Now this is because it's a routine question. Looking back at past papers you can see this style of question has been asked quite a few times, so it makes sense to include something like that. But it didn't have to come up that way. Here's another example. So this time this was a question I put in my Ed Excel paper 3. And this is the question that came up. Now this question does also look quite similar. All I did was looked at the topics in the advanced information and considered which ones might appear in a question together. Ultimately though, this is still incredibly lucky that this happened. So overall, my opinion is that predicting papers isn't really possible. The best you can do is probably put together some questions that are similar to past exam questions and just hope for the best. So what am I doing this year to write my practice papers? Well, let me show you. First of all, I've gone through every single past paper that there's been and looked at the frequency of different topics. You can see multiply and divide decimals here has only come up three times on the higher papers, whereas index laws has come up many times. And I've analysed this for every single question in quite fine detail. I've then used this information to calculate some statistical data. 
Here's a sample of some of the topics from the number section of the higher paper. You can see I've looked at how often it comes up in papers 1, 2, 3 and a few other different things. The first thing to notice here is that some topics are much more likely to appear in paper 1. For example, fraction operations at 60%, but it doesn't appear in paper 2 and 3 at all. This makes a lot of sense because if you have a calculator it will become easy. But sometimes I was surprised by what I saw. I usually thought that standard form would be a very common paper 1 topic, when in reality it actually came up on paper 2 and 3 more often. There's also some other interesting things to note that might just be coincidence. Take compound interest, it hasn't appeared on paper 1 yet, and that does make a lot of sense because you're probably going to need a calculator. So you'd think it'd be spread across paper 2 and 3, but actually it's come up on 90% of paper 2s. And something like perpendicular lines hasn't come up on paper 3 ever, but paper 2 70% of the time. I mean it's likely that this is probably just coincidence, and it may well appear on any of the papers still, so not too much to read into this data. And I've also looked at a few other measures. I've looked at appearance across a series. This tells you how often something comes up each year. So if it's 100%, it's come up at least once every single exam series. So you can see there are some 100% topics here. So, so far, every year we've had questions on index laws and standard form. Now, of course, this doesn't guarantee that they will appear again. In fact, they could easily be left out. But there are quite a few 100% topics, so to miss all of those out might make for a very different exam series. So I'd say revising these is essential. You also have some topics that don't occur very often, like this one here, ordering numbers. This doesn't necessarily mean again you don't prioritise it, because they may need to include it a few times in the future, and that percentage will increase. You may find it interesting to know that these are the topics that have appeared 100% of exam seasons for Edexcel Higher. I've also looked at whether topics appear multiple times across a series. So if we look at the topic of error intervals here, this one's quite interesting. It has an appearance percentage of 90%, which means there was only one exam season where there wasn't a question on error intervals, but it's got a 0% repeatability. This means, once it's come up, it's probably not going to be seen again. So a classic example of a topic that if it appears in paper 1, you probably don't need to revise so much for papers 2 and 3. There are however many topics that do appear multiple times throughout different papers. For example these ones here. And finally, I've also looked at the average marks per appearance. Some topics when they come up tend to only ever be worth one mark. You can see reciprocals here. But some topics also carry a lot more weight. So I've used this information to write the practice papers that you can currently see on my website. Well, what about papers two and three then? Well, I'm going to show you the tool that I've created to help me write my practice papers for paper two and three. I'll be sharing the output of this with everybody when paper one has been sat. So in column B here, you can see all of the topics from the course. You can see there are quite a few of them. Then in columns D and E, we have some priority columns, more on that in a moment. And then in column C, we're going to paste in the marks from paper one. Now I'm going to paste in some example marks here. This is some real data from November 2019. And you can see the tool suggests some topics which are very high priority. These are topics based on all of the data it thinks you should focus on the most, all the way down to very low topics. And you can see they're very low because they've already come up. It also suggests some topics for overlap, and we can also do the same thing for paper 3. So once we've had paper 2, we just paste in the marks here, and it will once again suggest priority topics for paper 3. Again, this is real data from November 2019, just as an example. Now it also makes suggestions for overlap, so these are the topics that tend to appear in both foundation and higher papers. This is particularly important if you're on the higher paper, for example, and aiming for a grade 4 or 5. So you might be wondering for the example we just used there for November 2019, just how good the tool was at suggesting topics to prepare for. Well, here's the output from that one. So this was real data in 2019, so we actually know what came up in each of the following papers. So on the left hand side here, we've got the topics it suggested for paper two, and you can see it suggested very high, and then it goes all the way down to the very low ones at the bottom. In this column here, it shows you whether it actually came up in paper two, as a yes or no. And then the same thing over here for paper three. You can see at the top, the very high topics did tend to actually come up, and the more we scroll down, we go down to the lower topics, and you see a lot less yeses and a lot more noes. In fact, the very low topics, none of those came up at all. So it does a relatively good job, but not perfect. So there will still be some topics that come in low that do end up coming up. I still wouldn't call this a prediction though, it's just careful planning and good analysis to try and make good decisions about what's best to prioritise. So, my final thoughts on this question. Are maths exams predictable? Well, my answer is, not really. 
I'd recommend that both students and teachers be wary of people using the phrase predicted papers, especially if there's a price tag attached. In reality, it's probably likely that most people, including myself, will be very far off from the real papers. Make sure the content that you revise is specific to your exam boards, and if you're unsure and you're a student, check with your teacher. Whether you're a student who's preparing for their exams, or a teacher who's preparing students for their own exams, ultimately the best way to prepare is to cover all topics with a good level of understanding so you're prepared for any question that could come up. Unfortunately, there isn't an easy way to cheat your way through the exam. You can't learn the whole course in a couple of hours. The only way to do it is proper hard work in practice. I wish everybody good luck with their revision, and I hope you find my predicted, I mean, practice papers, very, very useful.